Good morning, I'm Bram Resnick. I am with uh, KPNX TV, 12 News here in Phoenix. The, we are the NBC affiliate in Phoenix. I cover politics. I host a Sunday morning political talk show. Uh, I've been covering politics, immigration reform, government for the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, I want to say right off the bat, uh, my compliments to Todd and all the organizers. This is the most impressive collection uh, of national experts we've had in Phoenix on this very important topic here in Arizona uh, that I can recall in a long time, uh, if ever. So this is, this is quite a treat for me this morning uh, to listen to all of you uh, debating these very important issues. Our next panel is the economics of reform. I hope we can drill down on some of the numbers uh, in this debate, what it really means for the United States uh, to proceed with immigration reform as outlined in the Senate plan and some of the ideas in the House or not proceed uh, with those plans. Uh, our panelists this morning, uh, let's start over on this side, Alex Narasta of the Cato Institute. Uh, joining us via Skype from El Salvador is... <laughs> Professor Raul Inojosa of UCLA. And Todd, do we have the professor up there yet? Okay, we're still working on that. Skype, we're trying every, uh, our best to bring you the best experts uh, in the country on this issue. And uh, Alex and the professor are on the pro, oh. Okay. Okay. Professor, this is Bram Resnick in Phoenix. Can you hear me? Yes, hi, how are you? A very good, thank you. So I've just introduced the panel. You're going to be with Alex Narasta of the Cato Institute on the pro-economic reform, pro-reform uh, side for uh, the economics of reform. I'm just introducing the panel right now. Thank you. Uh, very good. On the uh, anti side, our all-star this morning, Professor Jan Ting, on his second panel of the day, <laughs> and Derek Morgan of the Heritage Foundation, joining us on the anti-reform side. Same format as last time, what you just saw. We'll go 10 minutes over here, pro, 10 minutes anti. Uh, then both of you can ask questions of each other. I may have questions for you as well. And then we'll have to take your questions from the audience. So Professor Inahosa, I'd like to start with you since you're on Skype and I don't want to lose your signal. Uh, can you pr make the case if you can, and since you're with, uh, paired with another panelist, take about five minutes or so if you can, make the case uh, for the economics and reform and, and why these, these plans in Congress are a good thing. Absolutely, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm speaking to you uh, from a beautiful country El Salvador, and, you, and the question uh, to ask is why uh, so many people, um, uh, you know, are going to the United States. What's interesting is that immigration, in and of itself, is actually the most positive uh, 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 mode of economic interaction with uh, these countries in Latin America. Every time a person crosses the border, they add value in the United States. And, uh, and actually, we're here with the United Nations summing up that every, every year, this little country of El Salvador contributes $75 billion uh, and over the last uh, 20 years. That's been over a trillion dollars of economic contribution that Salvadorians in the United States are contributing. Obviously, in the case of Mexico, it's multiples of that. So number one, you have, we have to understand we have to, that, that uh, immigration is a hugely, hugely beneficial dynamic. And that's really the secret uh, of American success is the fact that over uh, the centuries, it has actually been able to bring in people from other countries who, which, by the way, the taxpayers of a country like El Salvador prepare the people, which would have cost a lot more to prepare people once they're in the United States. Now, why the case for reform? The, the, unfortunately, right now, we bring in immigration uh, in a context where they are not fully contributing as they could. Their potential is not being um, uh, realized in part precisely because they, there is no legal framework to take advantage of this huge economic benefit. So what we did about five years ago was um, uh, calculate, and, uh, and actually we've been doing this now for a number of years, uh, that the uh, economic benefit to the United States over the next 10 years of a legalization such as that great American Ronald Reagan and the Heritage Foundation, by the way, supported, 
25 years ago, uh, would produce um, over a $1.5 trillion benefit to the United States. And where that, and by the way, that number, you may, it may sound familiar because now the Congressional Budget Office, uh, uh, a nonpartisan uh, group of economists, uh, has now uh, confirmed uh, uh, that number in using very similar technology. And by the way, this, te- this research was presented both published, both at the, uh, her- at the Cato Institute as well as in the um, Center for American Progress. So there is bipartisan uh, um, support for, this, uh, for these numbers. And what, what, what it comes down to is that uh, right now we do not have the legal mechanisms in place to bring in the workers that we need into the future. And it is definitely in our interest for those workers to come in as legal workers. uh, Like we know happened 25 years ago, their wages uh, after the uh, the 86 uh, IRCA bill, uh, uh, so said the first Bush administration in their extensive surveying, uh, in the first three years, uh, salaries went up by about 15 to 20 percent. And this was extremely important because it occurred even during an economic downturn, uh, um, which was from uh, um, uh, 88 to 91. So um, uh, what's extremely important to understand is that these are actually numbers that are actually very uh, uh, conservative. Uh, uh, we, We really do not use what's called dynamic scoring to its full extent. And what you can see when you do that and you add um, the, the uh, if you, uh, like we have done an analysis over the last 20 years of the impact of IRCA, uh, the asset building that immigrants now coming out of the shadows are able to not only have higher wages, but then fully participate in economic activity, uh, especially financial uh, assets such as housing, business, uh, the direct and indirect and what's called induced effects uh, are actually multiples of this 1.5 trillion number. Now, uh, um, the Heritage Foundation, unfortunately, uh, changed uh, uh, positions. Uh, uh, um, they used to support immigration reform. Uh, they were com- uh, they turned against it, apparently, in 2007 with a methodology that is deeply flawed precisely because it ignores all the economic benefits. So what we've done, and we've published it not only at the national level, but at the state level, if you go down to the, um, uh, the, the tax contributions, it's not only the direct contributions of immigrants, it's the indirect contribution through the value added that they produce in the economy and both direct and indirect, as well as what's called induced. Uh, this by far also produces a hugely positive fiscal benefit uh, for uh, for the United States. And I, I think my five minutes are up. I would just say uh, uh, um, uh, one more thing that I, I do think uh, uh, the immigration bill, as written now in the Senate, uh, could could use some modification. And maybe there's some uh, uh, agreement, especially since people are maybe, uh, as I understand the heritage position, worried about the fiscal impacts. Let me just give you some numbers. In the last 20 if years- If you can, Professor, just cost, about 30 seconds more. It used to cost $2,000 to catch a Mexican in 1992. We are now spending over $18,000 to catch a Mexican. With the uh, Senate Bill 744, uh, our estimates are that we will it will cost us more than a hundred and fifty thousand dollars to so call uh, uh, seal the border catch uh, catching the very few that will come. What we know is correct. What Ronald Reagan showed is that the best way to uh, secure the border is to allow the movement to occur legally. And the biggest drop off in the history of the United States of undocumented crossings and the biggest drop off in apprehensions uh, that, that uh, take away our, our, our law enforcement uh, activity occurred exactly the first 10 years after legalization. So, um, and finally, we need to think about, the Senate bill does not include 
what we're talking, what uh, is, is important in these countries. Uh, the, uh, uh, the sending countries not only uh, are contributing economically, but immigration reform ironically would reduce demand from El Salvador, from Mexico, uh, as wages would rise, simple supply and demand. As, Thank you, as, as Professor. As wages rose, professor. which is what we knew. Excuse me, Professor. Six, we need to think about how to fix uh, the root Excuse causes me, of immigration. I think that's I'm my sorry. Uh, five minutes. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> well done. I've been, I've been encouraged to enforce tough time limits here, so I don't want to sound rude, but that's, uh, those are the rules of the game. Uh, Alex Narasta, you can pick it up from there. Thank, uh, thank you very much. My name is Alex Narasta of the Cato Institute. I think I have some slides coming up real quick so I can talk to you all about some of the boring, nitty-gritty of the economics of immigration, but it's pretty important, I think, to get started. There are basically three broad areas that almost all economists agree upon, all economists from Milton Friedman to Paul Krugman. Um, the first one is that free trade is good for the economy. The second one is that price controls are bad. And the third one is that immigration is good. It's just a question of how good and for whom. Now, this first slide I have right here, this is a 30,000-foot representation of what the current immigration laws look like right now. <laughs> now, I have my Master's of Science in Economic History from the London School of Economics. This reminds me of a lot of uh, Soviet Union input-output flow tables that were used during communism to plan the economy. Um, but uh, basically, if you take a look at this, there is no pathway for low-skilled immigrants to come into the United States on a green card, unless they're related closely to an American citizen, uh, to come here. This is vastly different than the situation that most of our ancestors entered here under. So what about, um, this isn't working. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, there we go. All right, so uh, why do people come here in the first place? It's because they can make a lot more money here in the United States than they can in their home countries. Your average Mexican with a high school degree can expect wage increases of fourfold. Uh, for all these different countries, you can see that increase of fourfold, four, seven, nine, 16, and seven fold increase in wages for people who come here from every developed country in the world. That holds all of the things equal. This is what economists call the place premium. So you can understand a lot of the pressure that people have to come here. Um, so why are wages higher here in the United States? Well, the answer, quite simply, is that immigrants are more productive here in the United States. They have a marginal value product that's greater. And the reason why that is, is, you know, I come from a libertarian think tank. I think the answer is obvious. We have more capitalism in the United States and these other countries. We have more property rights, uh, security of contract, uh, stable government, relative rule of law. Now, when I say relative rule of law, I don't think any of you who've ever dealt with the IRS think that we have a rule of law in this country or dealt with the EPA, but it's all relative. We're not going to have the police burst into our house in the middle of the night to take our property for no reason. If we're going to get screwed, we know how we're going to get screwed in advance. That's pretty much <laughs> what the rule of law means. So uh, it doesn't so much that we redistribute global production to the United States. It's that immigrants who will come here are more productive once they come here. And as a result, we all become wealthier. Immigrants who come here produce more than they would in their home countries. So I read a lot of really boring academic papers, so you all don't have to. Um, taking a look at all the peer-reviewed academic literature of the impact of immigration on Americans by education group right here, the most negative one you will find in the entire peer-reviewed academic literature, that's a dynamic score, is by Borjas and Katz. It was published in 2007. And they estimated that all the immigrants from 1990 to 2006 lowered the wages of Americans with less than a high school degree by about 4.5%. Americans with a college degree or above about 1.5% but raise the wages for high school and some college graduates during that time period. This is a time period where we have about 30 million people entering the United States. However, a more common finding, this one by Ottaviano and Perry, which is also confirmed by other people like Ethan Lewis, who's another economist at Dartmouth, is that immigration has slightly positive wage impacts on almost all Americans uh, for various reasons. Both find that the positive impacts are less than 1%, but not negative. Now the question is like, why? Why would having more people come to this country increase wages of people? You know, if you think about supply and demand, you increase supply, you think the price goes down. Maybe the wage would go down. Well, not necessarily true. Immigrants move to jobs. They move to where the economic growth is in the United States. They move to where the opportunity is. Once they get there, they fill those jobs and they fuel that economic growth. Uh, immigration also induces companies to invest more 
in their uh, production and to hire and buy more factories and increase production. Uh, immigrants and natives have different skills. Even if they look the same on paper, uh, language differences, cultural differences, experience differences mean that they work in different types of jobs. Even if they have the same types of uh, education skills, all you need to do is take a look at where the poor immigrants who don't speak English very well work in restaurants compared to where the poor natives who aren't very well skilled who speak English as a first language work. We know these different types of jobs, they sort of uh, specialize in different areas. Um, and Last but not least, uh, increased economic demand. Immigrants are not just workers, they are also consumers. They buy goods and services. They, and they especially buy goods and services that are not traded across international lines. These goods are created by a lot of Americans. So let's move on. I only have a couple minutes, uh, about a minute, 30 seconds left. Uh, what about the fiscal impact? Um, there's a lot of different, um, you know, the way that you judge this is, is the extra revenue that immigrants pay in greater than the extra cost they're going to pay in? And basically, through all the different studies that come out, the answer is not that much. It's not that much of a difference at all. The or Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development came out with a huge study that judged all the different fiscal impact studies across the world in the United States. And they find out that uh, immigrants, on average, um, decreased government deficits by three-tenths of 1% of GDP per year, which is equivalent to about $45 billion they contribute in taxes more than they take out of the, um, uh, more that they take out of benefits every year. That's not a whole lot. It's slightly positive, but if you're going to make a determination based on whether immigration is good for the economy or not on its impact on government deficits, you should probably move on to a different subject. We take a look at it at the state level. Most states find almost no effect or slightly positive. I can get into more detail on that later. And what about economic freedom? I come from a libertarian think tank. I'm concerned with capitalism. Uh, are immigrants going to come in and vote for the Communist Party or you know, destroy economic freedom in the United States? We basically find no relationship over time of that. No relationship of greater uh, immigration and decreased economic freedom. So I think with that, I'm going to end my presentation almost on time. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll start with Derek Morgan of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Professor Hinojosa uh, had a lot of comments about the Heritage Foundation and some of your research, so I hope you speak to that as well as uh, whatever else you choose. Again, five minutes, please. I will, and I want to thank you all very much for uh, having me here today to discuss uh, areas of agreement on immigration as well as to have a, a debate. Uh, yes, there are points of disagreement. Um, don't be fooled. Uh, there is considerable common ground as well. I think we can all agree that the immigration system is broken. Uh, we can all agree on that. We can all agree that the system must be more rational, more humane, and more workable. We all agree that, in, uh, that enforcement of the law must be predictable and effective and fair. And we all agree that there are economic costs and benefits that must be weighed in our decisions about immigration. We all agree that we must have secure borders and that our national security requires secure borders. We know that drug cartels and other criminal activities pose a threat to our nation. Uh, we are mindful of the importance of immigration to the history and to the strength of this country. And we all condemn bigoted and racist actions. We know that immigration reform is a national debate, but here mm -hmm. in the Phoenix area, it's a local issue, a personal issue, a difficult issue with stories and faces that cannot be ignored. The issue is complex and resolution is difficult. Uh, we seek what are often called common sense solutions and that's why we're here today to talk about it. So the question becomes, how should we reform our immigration system? We know we should, we know we must. The central overriding question is how are we going to do that? So I would actually take a little bit of an umbrage at being labeled as anti-reform. Uh, I'm, I'm not anti-reform, I think the immigration system does need reform. Uh, and uh, as, as Jan mentioned, I'm also a lawyer, so I uh, could definitely see both sides of the argument, particularly on the, on the economic side of things. I think there are benefits and there are costs to be uh, considered. And uh, generally, as a, as a free market conservative, I'm in favor of the free, mar uh, free markets both for labor and for capital. Uh, I think that should be the, the default position for sure. And Jan, I think, did an excellent job of teeing up, well, we have this binary question of either open immigration or uh, do we have uh, limits on immigration? I think that is the fundamental underlying question. For me, it comes down to, uh, and, and, and you brought up the point that in the first 100 years or so of the country, we did have this open borders policy. To me, there's a very big difference between those first 100 years and today. Uh, there's many, but one of the biggest is uh, the growth of the modern welfare state. 
Uh, Milton Friedman, a libertarian economist, said you can't have open borders and a welfare state. And I think he was exactly right. Uh, um, immigration to jobs is a good thing for everybody. Uh, immigration into our, in our broken welfare system is, is not a good thing. Uh, so in this economic argument, one aspect of it that we need to consider is, um, is something that we wanted to think about too. What would be the cost of uh, open borders or even a legalization, a mass legalization? What would the effect be on the American taxpayer? We really wondered about that. And so, <clears throat> and so we looked at that carefully at all levels of government, not just the federal level, like the, the Congressional Budget Office did, but we wanted to look at state and local and uh, taxes paid and benefits received as well. So we actually calculated up, based on census data, how much in taxes do the current unlawful immigrant community pay in taxes? And believe me, they pay taxes. They pay sales taxes. They pay property taxes. Um, uh, the researcher even included um, lottery uh, uh, purchases, because those go into the schools and so forth. So we added all of that up, and then we added the benefits and the services that the immigrants uh, receive, the unlawful immigrants receive, and we did that according to the National Academy of Sciences uh, methodology. And we added it all up, and we found that it would cost taxpayers trillions of dollars over the lifetime of the un unlawful, uh, the undocumented community. Uh, I've got copies of the report at the back table back there if anybody wants to read it for themselves. It's been talked about a lot. Uh, I think if you read it, you'll find that it's, it's carefully done. There's lots of uh, caveats in there. There's lots of this. It could be a little higher if we count this. It could be a little lower if we count that. Uh, but I think um, we're still the only, only group that's looked at what would be the cost of the lifetime of the unlawful immigrant community, what would be the cost to the taxpayers? And I think that's an important part that we have to think about. Um, other areas of reform that I think would be uh, fruitful to discuss, particularly on the economic side, where I think there's probably a lot of agreement, include things like high-skilled workers. Um, in, in our report, we looked at uh, immigrant, immig all immigrants, legal and illegal, who come to the United States, for example, with a college degree, or what might be called a high-skilled immigrant. And uh, we found that not only do they contribute economically, but they also end up paying more in taxes than they receive in benefits and services, which ends up lightening the load for, for all of us as taxpayers as well. So that's kind of a, a no-brainer. Why wouldn't we want to have more uh, high-skilled immigration and make it uh, easier? And I know we're going to have an employment and visa conversation later, so that, that'll maybe be something to talk about there. We've also at Heritage historically been in favor of guest worker programs. We think that makes a lot of sense in sectors where it's clear that we, we have a, a labor shortage and we need... Uh, more workers. We think that can make a lot of sense as well. Um, so all that's to say, I think there's a lot of, of potential common ground for us to talk about. Uh, it, putting on my lawyer hat and, and arguing the economic side, typically at Heritage, we have not really um, uh, engaged too much on the, the economics of it, because again, we think the, the overriding concern is what kind of a society are, are we um, putting immigrants into? We want them to be in a freedom and opportunity society, not a a society that has a broken safety net that, encourage, that discourages work and discourages marriage and family formation. We know that immigrants who come here typically are very hard workers and have very uh, have uh, solid family values and structures and so forth. And we don't want to put them into a system that discourages those things. So we think that the time now, the time is now for welfare reform before we uh, add millions more uh, immigrants into the country. But a couple of things to at least think about. I don't know if Jan will talk about these things or not, but. Uh, we, you noted a couple of the studies, Alex, and appreciate you doing that. Uh, the CBO itself, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, which tries to have a, a center view of this thing and, and canvas the whole of uh, the economic literature, did predict that it would have a negative wage impact on low-skilled uh, native workers. So that's something to think about, uh, particularly the, you know in this, this time, in this era, when our, our low-skilled uh, friends and neighbors are struggling. Do we want to uh, add uh, an extra burden on them uh, and that downward pressure on their wages? I think that's only only common sense that if you greatly increase the supply of labor, you're going to decrease the wages. And, um, you know, in a time when we've got, for example, down, not far from here in Yuma, the unemployment rate's 18.8%. Uh, that's, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, and uh, so I think we want, to, we want to make sure we have an economy that's working before we're uh, adding millions of new uh, immigrants into the country, uh, un particularly unlawfully. Okay, thank you. Professor Ting. Me again. Uh, let me just say a couple of things in response to the comments from the other side um, that uh, how beneficial immigration is. Uh, if you believe that immigration has been as beneficial as purported, why not unlimited immigration? Isn't that the logical conclusion? If immigration brings all these benefits, 
more immigration will bring even more benefits. How do we get the number of illegal crossing and apprehensions down from the small number to zero? I can tell you how to get illegal border crossings down to zero. Unlimited immigration. If we allow unlimited immigration, there'll be no illegal border crossings. There'll be no apprehensions. There's, there's been mention about uh, free trade being one of the good things in the world. It's not a coincidence that the big sponsors of free trade, uh, including the outsourcing of American jobs, are among the strongest supporters of the Senate Immigration Reform Bill, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Cato Institute. Uh, you know, they're for free trade, they're for allowing the uh, outsourcing of jobs and markets, and they're also for uh, the, the Senate's uh, Im immigration reform bill. Let me just say something uh, statistically about uh, uh, what Derek's been talking about, the job situation. The November Bureau of Labor Standards jobs report just came out on December 6th. They report that officially, there are 11 million American unemployed, of whom 4.1 million are long-term uh, unemployed, 1.3 million of whom are going to lose their unemployment benefits on December 28th. I don't know what they're going to do. Um, in addition, officially, there are 8 million involuntary part-time workers who are working part-time because they can't find a permanent job at any wage. In addition to that, there are 800,000 discouraged American workers who are no longer working because they have come to the conclusion that there is no job available for them in this economy. You add that up, there's 20 million officially unemployed and underemployed uh, Americans in the U.S. The official unemployment rate is 7%, but among veterans, veterans, post 9-11 veterans, the unemployment rate in this country is 10%. Among African Americans, the unemployment rate in this country is 12.5%. Among teenagers looking for work, the unemployment rate in the United States is 18.6%. Among African American teenagers looking for work in this country, the unemployment rate is 35.8%. That is the reality of what we're facing. 47 million Americans are on food stamps, including obviously many of the people who are working, but are working at low wage jobs where they can't get out of poverty. That is the reality. President Obama says income inequality is tearing at the social fabric of the United States. Do we agree with that? I do. I mean, I think that's a real problem. What do you think the adoption of the Senate immigration reform plan would have on income inequality in the United States? Um, I think it would make it worse. The, the Professor Saez at Berkeley uh, issued a report this year uh, reporting that from 2009 to 2012, the top 1% of incomes grew more than 31%, the top 1%, uh, and the bottom 99% of incomes grew over that four-year period 0.4%. Right, and that SAEZ, S-A-E-Z, from Berkeley, you can look it up. Um, so why have we lost so many jobs? Why are there stagnant wages in the United States? Obviously, a lot of jobs have been lost to technology, right, to robotics, to the internet. And a lot of those jobs, frankly, are, are not coming back. Right? And, and obviously, we've lost a lot of jobs because of globalization, which is a worldwide phenomenon, including the outsourcing of American jobs. Uh, we're going to have a tough time uh, replacing all of, all of those jobs. That is part of the reality. And that is the context in which we need to talk about uh, what is the role of bringing more labor into the United States to compete against these unemployed Americans who are, who are looking for work. Um, we had a discussion last night about, you know, who do we, who do we owe loyalty to? There's a very uh, postmodern idea floating around academic circles that, hey, people are people. Citizenship doesn't matter anymore. What do we care whether the, the worker who gets a job is in China or India or in the United States? I don't know. I've always sort of felt that I have a kind of loyalty to this country, and if I can get an American into that job, I'd rather get an American into that job. Maybe that's just me. You know, maybe I'm out of step with the postmodern world that we're, we're growing into, but it just seems to me that it's logical. You have a loyalty to your immediate family. If you can get your kid into a job, you want to get them into a job. And you have your loyalty to your extended family. If you can uh, get someone, get your cousin into a job, you're going to get them into a job. And then if you have a job, you're going to try and get someone from your community into that job. So I, I think there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, we need more jobs for Americans. 
Um, and I'll just stop there. Great, great way to end that. Uh, I want to toss it back to this side and go to Professor Inahosa. Are you there, sir? Professor Inahosa, can yes, you? Here I am. Terrific. I know you have to leave real soon, so I want to get back to you, uh, particularly with the, the big number we've been talking about this morning. Uh, the way I read it, there is about an eight trillion dollar difference between the cost and uh, uh, negative impact, the benefit you see and the negative, negative impact the Heritage Foundation sees uh, when it comes to uh, immigration reform. Can you take about a minute or so and explain the difference in your eyes? Well, it, it ba basically, and I don't know how to say this in polite terms, but, but, uh, but um, the, the Heritage numbers really make no sense. They do, they do a multi-decade out uh, so-called cost uh, of uh, on the um, in terms of fiscal uh, uh, needs that um, by the way they, which they calculate not like the uh, the American Academy of Sciences which should be on the basis of individuals they do it on households which includes a lot of citizens that the last speaker is so concerned about uh, that actually uh, um, should not be counted in a number. And um, that what that does not take into account is that, oh, especially over generations, immigrants dramatically increase their ability to add to the economy. Uh, um, to say that, uh, uh, and, 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 and many people in the room probably can go back to think about their, um, their grandparents that may have come here uh, as, as, as immigrants, and many of them came in as low-skilled workers, and many people are now... Uh, the generations later, actually, some of the best uh, uh, um, advanced in terms of social mobility uh, throughout uh, the country. I would like to just point out a, 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 another issue that uh, that Alex and I and I think that we need to get this straight. That you know, one thing is to talk about marginal impacts of uh, which, unfortunately, has dominated the discussion uh, um, about uh, uh, African Americans and and immigrants. The reality of it is that in those communities where there are more immigrants, African-Americans do better. All right. Uh, so it, it doesn't make sense to do these national marginal studies. And the other thing that doesn't make sense uh, uh, is that it really uh, 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 can throw lots of other variables in which have nothing to do with immigration that is stagnating uh, wages, particularly in the low skilled uh, uh, where uh, areas where immigrants go, they actually revitalize economies. And again, the one thing that the marginal uh, research does not take into account is the huge positive benefit uh, that actually adding workers to the workforce uh, in terms of job creation. All right. So a lot of uh, the reasons why we see the positive growth for wages in African-Americans and even Latinos in those areas where there is most immigration is precisely because the types of things Alex mentioned as well, that there is these direct and indirect uh, effects that stimulate the entire uh, uh, e economy. Thank so, you. Uh, that, you know, thank I, you, I, Professor. I we, Professor, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, we're going to go straight to Derek Morgan. Morgan. And I want to clarify the numbers I'm talking about. Professor Hinojosa uh, said there was a $1.5 trillion benefit. I believe the Heritage Foundation study says there is a $6.3 trillion cost to the economy, correct? Yeah, the, uh, the major differences between the studies that are out there are um, our, our study looks at federal, state, and local. It's not just federal like the CBO numbers do. Uh, also, it's lifetime costs for the unlawful immigrant uh, community there. It's not uh, just 10 years or 20 years like the CBO did. Uh, and then third, ours is a, is a look at fiscal analysis. It's not meant to be a macroeconomic modeling of uh, immigration reform. Instead, it's meant to look at a, what's called a fiscal distributional analysis. It's work that uh, Robert Rector's done even on, in the American the domestic uh, population, looking at uh, the, the top quintile, second, third, fourth, and fifth quintiles, and so forth. The fact is we have a very generous welfare program. We've decided as a nation that we, uh, we want to help those who are in the lower uh, income uh, brackets uh, with massive transfers of wealth. And so let me just give you a couple of quick statistics. We were talking about uh, how the country's changed. 30 seconds, please. Sure. In 1935, 3% of federal outlays were for transfer payments. That's taking from one taxpayer and giving it to another, 3%. Uh, today, it's 67%. So you have a very different tax structure now. You have a lot of taking from some taxpayers and giving it to others. 
And over a lifetime, uh, it's not because undo undocumented uh, American or undocumented people in the country are not working. In fact, most are. Um, but just because of, uh, of where they are economically, they're not going to pay in as much as they receive out, just like an American citizen with that same level of skills or, or education would. So those are the three differences, uh, all levels of government, lifetime costs, and it's a, a fiscal analysis. All right. Thank you, Derek. Alex. So I was, uh, I, I debated uh, Heritage and Derek actually on this issue, on, on this, uh, this study uh, several times back when it came out earlier this year. And I just want to point out that one of the things is you can get a negative number a fiscal impact if you exclude all of the positive economic contributions, if you exclude the dynamic economic impacts. Um, I'm a big fan of the Heritage Foundation personally. Since 1970s, they've been arguing that we need to do dynamic scoring. We need to measure the impact that a certain policy has on people's incentives in the economy, the impact it has on the economy. What immigration does is it literally adds factors of production. It literally adds workers who come here to go jobs. I mean, the notion of saying the word unlimited immigration is a misnomer. It's not unlimited immigration. It's immigration when the market demands that there are immigration who come, immigrants who come into the United States. So what you do is when you exclude the economic benefits, you definitely get a negative uh, outcome. To take a look at the study in more detail, if you apply the same sort of uh, fiscal cost analysis, uh, the study concludes that 70% of Americans are a fiscal drain on the economy, and therefore, you know, following the logic, if 70% of Americans up and disappeared, we'd suddenly balance the budget or have sort of a more uh, decent um, economic or fiscal situation. Now, getting rid of 70% of people, I don't know how you can have too many high-skilled workers who are engineers or brain surgeons working if they also have to take out their own trash or build their own houses, or grow and pick their own food, everything else like this. You know, in a complex economy like ours, we have division of labor, we have specialization, immigrants fill certain niches, and on paper, if you exclude the dynamic economic impacts, it may look like a lot of these individuals are taking in more tax revenue in terms of benefits than they're paying out, but you have to include the indirect fiscal impacts. You have to include the specialization that this allows the rest of the economy to do. And uh, this report, sadly, um, unlike a lot of other ones that study this, uh, does not do that. That's why you have most state reports coming out saying immigration is positive for their state uh, the government budgets. You see it on the federal level when they took a look at that, and a lot of local level too. You do see uh, take a look at that. Now, I agree welfare is a problem, but if we are concerned about welfare, let's build a wall around the welfare state instead of around the country. It's, um, it's not only uh, uh, the welfare uh, programs, the means-tested welfare programs, of which there are uh, you know, about 80 of them or so. It's also our uh, expensive entitlement programs, and that's why a, a lifetime look at that population is important. And while a lot of the other studies don't do that, because uh, these programs are just set up so that those who are lower uh, wage workers throughout their lifetime end up getting three, four, or five dollars back for every dollar that they put in. So that that's uh, another reason why a longer look at is important. Okay. Uh, I want to take a moment to see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, let's go. I'm sure. One short one for Derek. Um, it, uh, in, in the in the positive impact Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I have to go. So thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for joining us and taking the time and making the effort. Question for Derek. Uh, thank you. Uh, Derek, in your, in your study of the positive, the tax, benef uh, the tax contributions, how did Heritage consider the, the undocumented workers who were on payrolls? How did you, uh, did, did you consider that, and if so, how? So the question was, did, you, did Heritage consider the undocumented workers on payrolls in factoring the, the whole economic impact? Yes. So the, the census data um, includes uh, payroll taxes, for example. So uh, that's another area where uh, the undocumented community pays a lot of taxes, uh, is uh, payroll taxes. And also sales taxes, uh, property taxes through your rent. When you're paying rent, you're in effect paying a portion of those property taxes. So we included all of those, all of those measures. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's a gal in the back there. Question? Hang on, hang on for the, uh, we'll get the mic to you. I want, shoot. <laughs> okay, distance. I wonder whether or not you considered the fact that undocumented immigrants are essentially barred from federal benefits, and they have been for about two decades. Um, even to get any benefits as a legal permanent resident, you have to be here f as a legal permanent resident for at least like five years. 
Um, and also, I think you need to consider the context of being in the state of Arizona, where immigrants, undocumented immigrants, are absolutely barred from receiving state benefits. Um, the only other case in which they can receive benefits generally is through school systems because in 1982 the Supreme Court said that you can't ban children on the basis of citizenship and there are really bare bones health benefits that are available to children only. Many of those children are citizens and um, there are externalities that arise when you do not apply benefits to children, um, when you do not provide services to any undocumented people. You have to deal with the negative benefits of not providing those resources of which there are many and I have always been very interested in why people do not calculate the cost of externalities when they are making up their calculations. Thank you for the question. Derek, yes, you're on the spot today. Uh, great. Um, so uh, the way the, the study looks at it is um, it looks at it was kind of modeled after the idea behind the Senate bill. So actually if you look at the study uh, during the interim period, sort of what we call the time period uh, right after the bill passes when uh, folks would be kind of on this uh, temporary legal status until they would get uh, later, later they would become eligible for the full panoply of uh, government services and, and benefits in terms of means-tested welfare and so forth. You find that actually it's not that much different after the legalization. Um, you, what you do see is that wages will go up, um, so we factored that into our uh, consideration, the fact that after a legalization uh, we saw this in 1986. The workers who were formerly unlawful um, are going to be able to qualify for more jobs, and their, wa their wages will go up a little bit. So we increase the amount of taxes that they're going to pay during that time. And then uh, the way the Senate bill is, is um, put together, uh, th that group of people is not really eligible for a lot of benefits still during that interim period. And so most, a lot of the cost is after that, that interim period, and, um, and especially uh, the uh, expensive retirement programs that we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the back there. And please keep your question to the point. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Ting, uh, in the last year here in Arizona, sir, you provided figures about uh, jobs that Americans want. But here in Arizona, and anecdotally, we had Danny's car wash raid by the federal government. That company had a very difficult time replacing those workers. We have companies like Rated ProServe. It's a maintenance company. No Americans showed up for those jobs. In Yuma, Arizona, no Americans have showed up to work there. And even in Alabama, nobody wanted to work in the agricultural industry. So the figures that you're given might be correct for inner city and particular figures, but how do you justify your figures in terms of what I just shared with you, sir? Well, it, it, it's hard. That we're, we're a big country, and labor needs obviously vary from place to place. Many years ago when I was working at INS, we, we would have delegations come to visit us who are asking for more immigrants. You know, I, I remember in particular having a delegation come from East St. Louis who said, can't you send us more immigrants? Can't you like open the door wider? Because we need more immigrants to uh, in our particular lo locality. And, and part of the problem is we, we looked at that question and we decided you can't constitutionally restrict people who are legal immigrants once they get into the United States to say, you know, you get a green card only if you live in East St. Louis uh, and, and, and nowhere else. You, you can't do that. Constitutionally, if people are legally in the United States, um, uh, they have the right to move around wherever they want, just like anybody else. And I, I'm sure our free market advocates would say that's how it should be. People should be able to move around wherever they want. So, so you're going to have a labor variance. Uh, you're going to have labor variance from place to place. I would just say as a general matter, that um, the problem with American workers is they expect decent wages and decent working conditions. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, if, if uh, you want to hire them, uh, you have to provide decent wages and, and decent working conditions. I mean, that is always an alternative. If you believe in market theory, you have to believe that everyone has a price uh, that uh, they're willing to go to work for. I, I sometimes say, hey, you know, you want to hire me to 
pick your fruit, I will do it. I am available, especially during the summers. You just have to meet my price. Thank you. And what is your price? <laughs> Pretty high. <laughs> Pretty high, yeah. Higher, higher than the play in Yuma. Here's how we're going to do. So Alex is going to respond. Then I'm going to go to one more question in the back. And then I'm going to ask each side to just say, because since it's all, this is about solutions, give us an idea of what you see in this set, what you've seen this from the Senate or the House that you think ties in, works toward the solution you think is appropriate. Uh, so, Alex, and so, then question. Very quickly, uh, the economy will adjust if we stop all immigration. The economy will adjust if we deport all the current unauthorized immigrants. The economy will adjust uh, if, we, uh, if half the population of this country dies from a plague. The question is, in all three of those situations, the economy will adjust primarily by shrinking. It will adjust primarily by decreasing the wages of other Americans who are here. If you can think about it this way, if you want to get rid of or you know, limit immigration, future uh, immigration to this, uh, to this country, you're also limiting the future number of consumers. You're limiting the future number of entrepreneurs who are going to create jobs. You're limiting the future number of workers who work with Americans in the labor market to produce. So you know, if you want to focus in on farm workers, Yes, uh, the, the low-skilled workers in the farm industry who are actually picking a lot of the crops, fruits, and vegetables, those are immigrants or unauthorized immigrants. But you don't see the impact on Americans who drive the trucks of a lot of that fruit and produce into the market. You don't see the impact of the lower prices that American consumers pay in order to buy this food, which frees up more money that they can buy for other things. So yes, the economy will adjust if we put in place more strict immigration restrictions. But it will adjust by shrinking. And you might say, oh, well, what about the wages for um, most skilled Americans? What about the wages that we see on this, um, this down end? Don't we see like uh, wages uh, shrink at the bottom if we add more people in? There's some economic evidence that there is maybe in some areas some of that. There's also a lot of evidence that says because these immigrants are different, they don't compete directly with Americans. But if we have immigration to jobs, if we have immigration to demand in the marketplace, why do we want to limit that? Why do we want to just, uh, limit the ability for the economy to outgrow that? And if you say, well, we have a poor person come in who makes less money, therefore um, economic inequality is going to increase in the United States, well, what you have is what I like to call the Danny DeVito fallacy. If Danny DeVito walks into this room, the average height of everybody in this room, the average decreases, but nobody's actually any shorter. So that's what I want to end with that right now and, and, go, and uh, go to the next question. The Danny DeVito fallacy. That's a good one. Okay, question in the back. All right. Thank you. And again, please keep it to the point. Okay. So we talk about borders, but I don't hear much talk about the Canadian border our northern border, where white people generally live. I want to make that point. And um, as a Republican, I would like to know why Republicans are imitating the laws of communist or the ideas of communist regimes in looking toward a wall as a solution. We live in a high-tech global society. Can't we come up with a better solution than a wall? And people who think you can build a wall across the whole border do not understand that people own private property on the border. So what are you going to do, condemn their private property and take it from them? And so my question is, why can't we think out of the box? Why can't we think about having ideas and solutions that help Mexico and other countries to prosper so people can be happy if they want to live in their own lands? Why can't we think of solutions to immigration that help our country as well as other countries to succeed? Uh, that's a big question. I'm going to try and focus it and just make it, uh, turn, it turn it into an economic question is maybe a different way of looking at this, what our questioner suggested, is to help Mexico, help Me Mexico's economy in some way. Well, I think um, the, the North American Free Trade Agreement was an attempt to try to help people on both sides of the border uh, to engage in free, free uh, you know, uh, tax, not a tariff, uh, trade situation, I think that's probably helped a lot. Um, we heard from the last panel that uh, in Mexico, in many, in many senses, is actually doing, doing a lot better. And that's good news for everybody, I think. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of uh, wisdom in that idea that we try to help folks in, in their own countries uh, better their own conditions. I think, um, I think that's, a, that's a great thing to do, and we can do that by trading. By you know, We have comparative advantage in some things in the United States, and they have comparative advantage in some things in Mexico, and we can trade together, and we can lift uh, both sides. Alex, do you want to take that? Um, so, Sorry, could you check your mic just one second? Test, test, test. Okay. You got me? 
Thanks. So from 2006 to 2010, net migration from Mexico to the United States was about zero. Now, you had more people entering the United States from Mexico, of course, but you also had a lot of people leaving the country because the economic decline, especially in the industries where a lot of uh, Mexican immigrants worked, was sending a lot of people back home to their country, the, the construction decline, etc. So I don't like to focus on Mexico as much anymore because since 2008, Asian immigration to the United States has outpaced Hispanic immigration to the United States, and that is getting wider and wider every year. The Hispanic immigration wave to this country, which began in the early 80s, peaked and crashed around 2006, 2007. It's not going to get up to the numbers that it was before. It was. So this focus on a wall, this focus on, you know, I, I do believe that we need some border security, and I think we have a lot of it right now. We just need a lawful way for a lot of these people to enter going forward so that border security and these uh, folks in Customs and Border Protection can focus on the actual criminal elements, can focus on, the, on the, a lot of the, um, the uh, people who want to come here and actually do us harm as opposed to trying to weed out the vast majority of people who are just otherwise law-abiding workers. They're just breaking international labor market regulations. Like, interestingly, that's what immigration restrictions are. When you go back to the early 20th century, it was the progressive movement, it was labor unions, it was the AFL-CIO, or the predecessor that the AFL, that was arguing for immigration restrictions. It was those people who were defending free markets um, who were arguing in favor of it. And I'd like to, you know, get back to that and remember that immigration restrictions are a massive government interference into the economy. 45 to 70 percent of the global of uh, American economic production comes from the labor market. If we actually believe in capitalism, if we actually believe in free markets, I think we should free that up a little bit. We should free that up a little bit so there's a little bit more international movement so we can get more people who come to the United States when there are jobs available to work in industries. There is no, it doesn't make any sense to me if we have the jobs that are available that specific immigrants can fill much better than some people in the United States who are currently here right now, why we don't allow them to fill those jobs right now? Why do we have to get the government in between a willing foreign worker and a willing domestic employer? And that's really what we're talking about. It's not unlimited immigration by any stretch of the imagination. Markets limit things. This is limited immigration to jobs and economic opportunity in the United States. Okay, Professor Ting wants to make two quick points, then we're going to wrap it up with solutions. Alex po posed as, a, as an alternative, shrinking the economy through a more restrictive immigration system. I don't think anyone on any of the panels today is advocating a more restrictive immigration system. What we're talking about is whether we want a immigration system limited only by the market, uh, as Alex suggests, or whether we want an immigration system that's limited by something else. Uh, that, that's what the debate is about. The questioner just asked a question about why are Republicans supporting a border wall? And, and I agree, uh, as those $18 billion spent uh, enforcing immigration laws isn't enough. We have to throw more billions of dollars at it. That's what uh, this Senate immigration bill is going to do. And, and my answer is it's political cover. Uh, people want uh, reassurance that uh, the uh, legalization isn't going to encourage even more people to come relax, we're spending even more billions on building a border wall, right? Don't worry. So it's just political cover. There's no other reason for wasting uh, taxpayer dollars that way. Okay. And now we're going to wrap this up with your solutions. So take what we know about the Senate plan, the House plan. How do you think they tie into the potential economic impact? So I think uh, the Senate plan and the House plans that are being discussed are a move in the right direction. Um, a lot of it gets compared to the 1986 Reagan amnesty. Um, so that bill, 1986, had two components. One was an amnesty for a lot of the people here who were here unlawfully, and it really was a fairly simple way to get legalized. Uh, the other component was increase in border security, which did occur. What you missed was the other stool, the other leg of the stool of economic and immigration reform, which was they did not increase the lawful ways for a lot of people to come to this country legally through a guest worker visa program or through a, a, some other sort of mechanism. What you want to do, if you want to shrink the black market, and I can't believe I'm saying this as a libertarian, but if you want to regulate immigration, if you want to know who's coming into this country legally, if you want to make sure that you decrease the number of people who are coming in illegally so that you can get a handle on it for security reasons, um, for, for crime reasons, then you want to increase the lawful numbers of people who can come here to work so that you can shrink the size of that pool of people who are crossing the borders. There's a reason why illegal immigration was not a problem when the United States had open borders uh, or at least uh, very um, uh, open borders in the 19th and early 20th century. It was because people came through border checkpoints. They came through Ellis Island. They came through Castle Island. They came through centers uh, set up on the West Coast and other places. 
places because they focused on excluding people who were, you know, had deadly communicable diseases or were obviously covered in prison tattoos or other things like that. The only way that you can regulate people who come into this country is if you widen the gates and uh, focus your enforcement efforts on people who you actually want to exclude. Now, this Senate bill and a lot of the efforts in the House, I think, are a step in that right direction. I think that it's not big enough of a step because there are a lot of regulations that are thrown in that are going to make it more complicated and more abusive, but making it so that, and and I want to point back to 1950s during the Bracero program. Now, Bracero was a big problem. There were a lot of problems with Bracero, but what you had was a 90% decrease in unauthorized immigrant crossings once that program was put in place, a 90% decrease because there was a lawful way for people to enter this country. What the INS agents and the um, Border Patrol did at that time was they went around to farms in the American Southwest and they did spot legalizations of people. They took their picture, they took uh, some of their, their information, they funneled them into the, into the legal market. The great role that border enforcement can have in this new system is to funnel peace, otherwise peaceful and law-abiding people into a legal market so we can know who they are to cut down on potential security concerns and to decrease the demand for unlawful immigration going forward. We cannot have a law enforcement only uh, solution. This is a law enforcement plus a deregulation and increase in legal immigration solution that will only solve this problem going forward. All right, thank you. And Derek. Yeah, I think there's um, a, a lot of good things that we could agree on on a way forward and solutions. Uh, I think we first need to get the economy back on track for everybody, for uh, people here now and for people who are going to come here to our to our country to, to build our country. Um, and so I'd like to see us work on some of those solutions uh, as well, but perhaps before having massive increases in immigration. When, uh, when you do have a poor economy like this, it's harder to get the American people behind such a such an idea. Um, also, I think we need welfare reform. Um, I know these are kind of a far field from immigration, but I think they're all related. Uh, we need to encourage uh, work among all Americans. So we only have work requirements in about one or two out of 80 welfare programs, and uh, including no work requirement on food stamps, for example, even though a lot of people on food stamps are working. Uh, but we need to encourage more work uh, among Americans. Um, we also, uh, as long as we're going to have limits on immigration, again, that was the existential question that Jan posed to us earlier, as long as we're going to, we really ought to make sure that it's competitive with the rest of the world, that we are competitive with Canada and Australia and have a skills-based immigration system to make sure that we are matching uh, the immigrant population with, with what the market needs, and we need to do that with as little interference as possible. So uh, I think probably Alex and I would agree on that, uh, that if you're going to ha have a, a legal immigration system, let's make it work. <laughs> I think we all probably know people who are stuck in our broken immigration system. It's just not very efficient. It's bureaucratic. Um, even in the Senate bill, a number of the, the provisions uh, would just add layers of, of tape on high-tech workers that even the, uh, many of the uh, tech companies that were alluded to earlier were, they, why do we have to have all these restrictions? So I think we need to work on that. Also, I think uh, there is a place for a guest worker program, like Alex was talking about. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense, particularly in those areas where it's pretty clear we have a, a labor mismatch. And so we need to do that. And the bottom line is we need to reform the immigration system so that we, do ha we are making it a legal immigration re uh, reform, not illegal. Legal immigration is good for the United States. Illegal immigration is bad for the United States. All right. Derek Mo Morgan, Jan Ting, Alex Narasta, and Raul Hinojosa in El Salvador. Thank you all very much. Great debate. Thank you.